Well, hello, church family. This is the update for the week of May 27th. Uh, first thing I needed to just remind you of is pertaining to Family Promise, uh, our church's opportunity to serve those who find themselves without their own permanent housing. It's a ministry that our church has been involved in since its inception into Lawrence. Our church is one of the 13 churches which in normal conditions open their facility to provide housing for these families. Uh, this takes place one week out of every quarter. Uh, our rotation begins uh, the week of June 21st. And due to the pandemic, the families being served at this time, they're being housed in, in temporary housing. However, churches are still providing food items for the families. And this is where our responsibility begins. We will provide food items for these families during the week of June 21st. A sign-up genius will begin next week, and you can find the, the sign-up link through our church website, which again, just a reminder, fsbcfamily.com. This will allow you to sign up to provide specific food items from that list. Uh, we are extremely grateful to everyone who is always willing to step up and provide whatever the need might be to just provide food items or in normal conditions serve as hosts or preparing meals. We just appreciate the many people who are involved in, in this ministry and grateful for those who lead us. Secondly, all things are beginning to reopen throughout our community and our personal involvement in activities begin to increase. The pace of life begins to accelerate. Uh, let's not jump back in without continuing to set forth a Christ-like example by the words that we speak and the actions that we put forth. May our lives truly reflect well on Christ. Remember what the Apostle Paul wrote to the believers at Corinth, so whether you eat or drink or whatever, and there's that all-encompassing word, whatever, do it all. In other words, everything I do, we're to do it all for the glory of God. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now there may be guidelines, dates, number restrictions, things that have been put in place that you agree with, and there may be things that you don't agree with. It should not be a case of where we fall on whether to wear a mask or not or who we declare our support and agree with, our party affiliation, whether Republican or Democrat, whether to open up or stay closed. It's not about getting what we want. It's not about glorifying man, but rather glorifying our Lord in all that we do and say. Let's not forget we are recipients of grace, and we are to be vessels through which grace flows. May we extend grace to all, and may our hearts be filled with love to all people. May the Lord be pleased by the words that he hears and actions he sees coming forth from his children. Third thing I wanted to share with you relates to just staying connected. Though our city is beginning to reopen and there are those within our community and our church family who fall into the highly vulnerable category, they will not be venturing out at this time. Let's make sure that we not overlook our family and friends, neighbors, church family members who will remain in their homes while others are returning to their jobs, to church, to stores, to shop, and so forth. I urge you to give someone a call. Check on your neighbor. Send a card to a church family member. Bless someone's day by staying connected. And let's make sure that everyone is taken care of, whether it be people that we see, have conversations with, or people that are still having to remain in their homes. Let's take care of everyone. Stay connected. Something to consider. What I'm about to share is a compilation of my thoughts, an excerpt from an article I read, and then what God provides us from his word. First of all, I want to read an excerpt from an article titled, Why Canceling the 2020 Southern Baptist Convention Annual Meeting is Putting Gospel Above All. Is written by J.D. Greer. Greer is the pastor of the Summit Church in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, in that area. He also serves as the president of our Southern Baptist Convention. Now, I will tell you right up front that what I'm about to read is somewhat lengthy, but I think it provides us with a parallel to another time in our world when humanity faced a similar scenario to what we see taking place in our world today. 
so please stay with me through the entire excerpt. Greer writes, Historically, we know that the church is at its best in times like these. It's when the power of the gospel really begins to shine through. This is an extraordinary gospel moment. Historian Rodney Starks describes how God used a moment like this in the early days of the church to expand the gospel in unprecedented ways. In AD 250, an enormous plague struck the Roman Empire, killing an average of 5,000 people every day. At this time, Christians were less than 2% of the entire population. Their numbers were growing, but statistically speaking, they were nearly insignificant. Yet despite their numbers, their response to this pandemic won admiration and a greater following. Diocenes, Bishop of Corinth, reported, Most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took care, took charge of the sick, attending through every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy. Many, in nursing and curing others, transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. Outside the church, the situation was much different. Diocenes continues, but with non-Christians, everything was quite otherwise. They deserted those who began to be sick, fled from their dearest friends. They shunned any participation or fellowship with death, which yet with all their precautions, it was not easy for them to escape. Stark even points out in evident irony that the death rate for Christians in many of these plagues was actually lower than that of those who simply fled. In some cases, he writes, by as much as one half. Why? Some analysts say it was because of their strong sense of community, their refusal to submit to despair, their commitments to care for each other, and their robust hope in the face of death. In other words, through their willingness to embrace death, they found life. Andy Crouch wrote, If you were a first century Roman, after you'd recover from the plague, where would you want to worship? The pagan temple, whose priests and elite benefactors had fled at the first sign of trouble, or the household of the neighbor who had brought you food and water, care and concern, at great risk to themselves. When this plague has passed, what will our number, excuse me, our neighbors remember of us? Will they remember that the Christians took immediate, decisive action to protect the vulnerable, even at great personal and organizational cost? Will they remember that being prepared and free from panic, the household of their Christian neighbors were able to visit the needy while protecting them by keeping appropriate social distance and provide for their needs and bring hope? How will we conduct ourselves in this moment? Will we demonstrate to the world what we actually believe about the gospel? Our theology is about to be on display, so let's make sure to be faithful witnesses. We may be living through a very new day, but God promises that he gives new mercies for new challenges. He never runs short on supply. The shelves of his heavenly riches are never empty, and his angels never get sick. Let's call on him for grace to meet this challenge. My closing thoughts. Our love for those in need reflects the Father's heart. We may not like all that's been happening, all the changes that are taking place. We have made, may have had moments of frustration, and these feelings and or thoughts may continue to arise. But let's not allow any of the negative to get in the way of carrying out the work that God has placed before us. Let's be faithful to our Lord and to those he has placed before us. Here's what God's word has for us in Matthew chapter 25, verses 36 through 40. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I, I was in prison and you visited me. And then the righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, 
I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are doing it to me. See, something happens, as Chuck Swindoll puts it, something happens when you stoop and take time to care for those who can do nothing for you in return. God's word also offers this to us in Mark's gospel, in Mark chapter 10, in verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. He did not come to be served and pampered and indulged. He came to serve and to give his life and to die. As Mark put it, to serve others and to give his life. And as followers of Jesus Christ, these are our marching orders for today and every day for the rest of our life. Have a wonderful day, and I look forward to sharing with you this coming Sunday in worship.